Hey there, everybody. This is Brendan with Common Motor, and you're watching our carburetor synchronization part two for the four-cylinder Hondas. Now, in this video, we're going to be going over the actual synchronization process in real time on the bike while it's running. However, if you've not watched the first video, we highly recommend watching that first. We talk about why synchronization is important, what it does, and how to get the system set up or the tool set up on the bike to perform it. So if you haven't watched video one, go back and watch video one. We'll have the links below. And if not, let's move forward and get into the synchronization of this CB550. There's a second layer to the carb sink as well. And it has to do with the generations of carburetors. And we're gonna break the carburetors for all these vintage Hondas in two main categories, an early style and a late style. And that line is gonna be drawn somewhere around 1975, 1976, meaning the early style is 75 and down and the late style is gonna be 76 and up. The main difference between these two different styles of carburetors has to do with the idea of what's called a reference carburetor. And what a reference carburetor means is a carburetor that is stable that you then adjust the other carburetors to. Whereas the late carbs have a reference carb and the early carbs, like this early CB550 set, doesn't have a reference carb all four carbs are individually adjustable. And so there's a slightly different process in the approach of how you deal with the early style carbs versus the late style carbs with a reference carb. The strategy for the earlier set of carbs that don't have a reference carb is slightly different in the fact that each one of these carbs has an adjuster on it. So in this case, in these 550s, I have one, two, three, and four. So each one can be adjusted. Really the strategy on this is gonna be, you know, take the vacuum readings off of each carburetor and find the two that are closest together and use those as your reference carbs. Then take the two that are the furthest away and try to adjust them where the, uh, the numbers are more even to each other. And as you kind of keep tweaking back and forth, hopefully you can get them all to be the same value, but uh, there really is no one place to start. It's gonna be based on which two carbs you find are closest together and getting those two carbs identical and then bringing the other two into the fold. Another note on this is you can run out of adjustment range on these adjustment screws. So make sure you have plenty of uh, thread here where you can thread the screw in and out so you don't run out of uh, screw thread. Same thing for the, uh, the idle speed screw. If this thing is too far in, you're not gonna have enough thread adjustment. So you kinda have to find a position where um, you can have enough adjustment in or out as you're doing this, because you can run into a wall if you go too far in one direction. If that happens, you kinda have to start the whole process over again. So a little different strategy on these. And that's why I got away from these carbs and went to a reference carb type system in the later bikes. Our sink uh, set is in place, gas tank's in place, fuel's on, all the lines are hooked up, access to all the parts ready to go. And my next step is I'm gonna actually warm up the bike, let the bike run for about five, eight minutes or so to get to operating temperature. Because after the bike warms up, the idle speed changes and I want to be doing the setting at ideal operating temperature. However, this is a bit tedious and it can take a while. So I have a fan here that's gonna blow air on the engine and try to keep it under, uh, keep it from overheating. So it's kind of a, a juggling act there, but let me get the bike going, turn the fan on, we'll come back here in a few minutes. Bike is warmed up, and we're gonna point some details out here at the carbs, and we'll work ways up to the controls. So our carbur carburetors are numbered one, two, three, and four, just like the cylinders are uh, when you're doing ignition timing or valve setting. Now on this bike, carb number two here, Right there, that is my reference carb. It does not have an adjustment screw on it. If you look real closely, you can see right there, that's an adjustment screw for setting the sink. So number four has it, number three has it, number one has it, but number two doesn't. So what's gonna happen is we're gonna be adjusting number one, three, and four in reference to number two. Now, as we change the idle speed screw, which controls the overall idle speed of the bike, it will change number two. So we're gonna do adjustments in a certain sequence where we make an adjustment, check the RPM, go back to the reference, go back to the carburetor that we adjusted and see where we are. Now, each four of those carbs are linked up to this valve here. This is kind of a gang valve. And that's carb one, two, three, and four. And what we're gonna be doing is toggling on each carburetor uh, to take a reading off of it one at a time. That's why we use this valve here. Also, this little rubber uh, boot on here we'll use to clear the line between, uh, between readings. Line connects up here. 
to our vacuum gauge, which I have just sitting up here, so I can read it by the tachometer. And I also have this inline valve here. This is gonna control the gauge flutter, uh, how, how crazy this gauge is moving back and forth. So when we're looking at this gauge here, the vacuum reading is gonna be on this, this uh, side of the gauge. And we're gonna be looking at the inner values here, this millimeters of, vac of, of, of mercury, that's gonna be the vacuum reading. So you got a 100, 200, 300, et cetera. That's what scale we're looking at right here. As far as any of this other stuff, as far as the, the red areas, the normal, whatever, ignore that completely on these bikes. This is actually for automotive level adjustments but it's not going to really affect what's happening here on these bikes. What we're going to be looking for here is consistent values uh, on the gauge. Now, we're not going to hit any magic number. We're just going to look for the same number across the board. And once we're able to hit the same number across the board on all four carbs, we're in sync. So again, don't worry about what the number is. All we care about is that they're all going to be the same. On the tachometer, we're going to bring the engine up, engine speed up to about 2,000, 2,200 RPM here for the process. We don't want to be doing it down at idle. It's going to be too slow. We want to bring the RPM up just a little bit. So we're going to pick that as kind of our floor. 2,500 would work, but I usually find 2,000, between 2,000 and 2,500 to be a good spot. So every time we make a change to a carburetor, it's going to affect the speed. So we make a change, we bring the speed back up to where we were, and then we check our vacuum. All right, so let's go ahead and do an initial reading on the bike and see where we are and we'll kill the bike and we'll talk about what we found. So power's on, start the bike. Turn on my fan. I can hear it's off. First thing I'm gonna bring that RPM up a little bit to just a little bit above 2000 RPM. Up there, good. I'm gonna open up cylinder number two. That is open. I'm gonna open up this valve and we're gonna watch the needle. See how it's fluttering? I'm gonna close it and it causes the needle to stabilize. But just like turn it off, it's too, it's too low. I want I want it to have a little bit of, just a little bit of wiggle to it. Engine speed changed. I'm gonna bring it back down to two. Okay, so we're reading about 300 millimeters? Okay. Turn off number two. I'm gonna clear the gauge. I'm gonna open number one now. Our value is at 100. This tells me that this carburetor is further open than a reference card, so it needs to be closed. I'm gonna turn off number one. I'm gonna clear the gauge. Let that vacuum out. I'm gonna turn on number three. We're at like 150 on number three. Close number three. Zero the gauge. Let's open number four. Look at that. Number four is about 325-ish, 330-ish. So number one and uh, number two and number four are almost in the same spot. I'm gonna close number four, all right? Let's go back to number two again, our reference. 
see how they're in the same spot. So that means I don't need to mess with carburetor number four. So we just took an initial reading off the bike. We saw what our reference carb number two was doing, and it was reading around you know, 30, 30 and change. We saw carbs number one and number three way off from that. Those carbs were, had a much lower vacuum number to them. Now what happens is if you see a very low number on the gauge, it says that that slide or butterfly is more open and more air is passing through it. The opposite happens if the slide or butterfly is actually closed more. You're going to have a higher reading on the gauge or higher vacuum signal. So this tells me that carburetors number one and number three need to actually be closed a little bit and the vacuum signal is going to go up. When we checked cylinder number four, it was almost dead on the money in the same spot as cylinder number two. So that tells me that it's where it needs to be and I don't want to mess with it. So we're really going to mess in this particular bike on cylinder one and cylinder three. But every bike's gonna be different. Every time you take the carbs off and go through them, it's gonna be in a different spot. So it's never one thing. It's always good to come back to that reference carb and see where you are and do the adjustment. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fire this back up. We're actually gonna start making the adjustments and going through the adjustment cycle and getting this all locked down, okay? Number, number two, we're at two grand. We're like 325-ish. Okay, let's adjust cylinder number one. Zero that, open up number one, it's too small. I'm taking my sink wrench. I'm gonna stop there. Notice how it drops. Bring it back up. Back at two. I'm reading right there, number one. See how it's a teeter-totter? One affects the other. So that was number two. Back to number one. So we got closer. We closed the gap. Let me do a little more. Now we're here, number one. Number two, we're really close, so I'm gonna leave it there. This is number three, let's adjust. Notice the RPM drops, right? Bring the RPM back up. Okay, we're at two. We're now reading about there. Turn it off. Start the cycle again, number two. Number two is reading around there. Number one, about the same. Number three. Number 
far. We ended up getting the, the two carbs that were out, carbs number one and number three, back in sync. But you can see every time you make a change to one carburetor, it has kind of a domino effect to the other carburetors. Think about like a, a classic kind of balance scale. You change one thing, it's gonna affect the other side. So every time you make a change, that's why it's important to uh, make sure your RPM is back to where you were. In this case, we had 2000 RPM. And I checked my reference carburetor first. Again, I'm trying to make the other ones be adjusted in the same spot it is at. But every time I make a change, I change kind of its uh, starting place or its benchmark spot. Now this is really close. I'm probably gonna tweak on this a little bit more because I like to get them perfect on the money. But uh, right now this would probably be good enough for the bike to run. And you could also hear on the camera, all of a sudden the bike started running smoother and smoother and smoother. That's what happens when the sink it gets to be where it needs to be, the engine will smooth out and start to idle a lot more stable. Another note I'm gonna point out that while I've loosened up the screws to do the sink with my sink wrench, as you go in and tighten the screws, much like when you adjust the valve of the engine, you can change the value. So when you tighten them, it's very important to hold the screw in place with a screwdriver and just tighten the nut up barely and check the sink. Sometimes that little bit of adjustment and tightening the screw can throw it off. So uh, it's a little bit of a back and forth game. But once you got them locked down and they're all even, your sink is set up, we can put all the parts back in the bike and go take it for a test ride. We have fast forward to the future. We let the bike sit for a couple hours and cool off. After we did our sink, we got everything back together on it. And we're gonna show you how well the bike starts now that it's actually all tuned and everything's perfect. I turn the gas on. I'm gonna show you that the bike is cold. Like I can touch every component. It's not warmed up. Touching the pipes here. All right, gas is on. Kill switch is on. Key is on. I'm gonna go full choke. Like that. That's how easy the bike should start when everything is in perfect tune. Tap the button, ice cold, ready to go. Our carb sink is now complete on the CB550. You know, the process is gonna be really similar for your other four cylinder Hondas. So make sure you check your service manual for all the little details on it, but it's gonna be relatively the same as what we just did here on this bike. And as you can see, it starts and it's running fantastic. And actually when we take it out on the road, it's going to perform great. So I want to emphasize how important the vacuum sink is and how big of an impact it makes on the running of the bike. With that, this is Brendan here with Common Motor, common-motor.com on the internet. Thanks for watching. Uh, make sure you follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Subscribe to our newsletter via our website. And of course, subscribe down below to this YouTube channel. And we will see you next time.